I will be presenting our work on Curator, a self-managing storage system for enterprise clusters. This is work that has been going on for the last five years or so at Nutanix and is part of an operational system that has been deployed in thousands of clusters, uh, in thousands of customers. Um, it's a long list of authors, many uh, wonderful engineers from Nutanix, my advisor at UDAV and me which we've been recently collaborating in some research projects together. So let me get started. Enterprises have been increasingly relying on cluster storage systems. Uh, these systems provide transparent access to storage in the sense that they can run applications without any modifications. And also enterprises can scale up the storage by buying more resources. Either they can buy dedicated storage nodes, as is the case of storage area networks, or they can buy more general purpose nodes where the compute is co-located with the storage, as is the case of Nutanix solution. These systems embody significant functionality. Uh, they support automatic replication and recovery to deal with faults. They provide seamless integrations of SSDs and hard drives, and they support storage workloads suited for virtual machines through mechanisms such as a snapshotting uh, and reclamation of unnecessary data. And they also perform a bunch of space-saving transformations like compression, dedupe, and erasure coding, and many others. Closer examination of these tasks reveals that much of their work can be performed in the background in order to keep the IO path as simple as possible. So as part of this work, we pose the following question. What is the appropriate system support for engineering these background tasks? Uh, in this talk, I will go over Curator, which is a framework and system support for building background tasks. In order to realize this system, we faced, we faced three main challenges. The first challenge was that we needed an extensible, flexible, and scalable framework that was able to support a broad class of background tasks and that could scale with the amount of storage served by the storage system. In order to address this challenge, we borrow ideas from big data analytics but use them inside of a storage system. The second challenge is that we need appropriate synchronization between these background tasks and the foreground I.O. For this, we co-design some background and foreground components. And the third challenge is that we need to deal with heterogeneity across clusters and even within individual clusters over time. And for this, we use reinforcement learning. So in the first part of the talk, I will go over the first two challenges, and then I will address the, the latter one. Um, so regarding this extensible, flexible, and scalable framework, uh, Nutanix built a uh, distributed key value store that holds all the metadata in the system. The foreground work, which is done by this IO service component that you see in the left, coordinates with the background work done by this storage management component through this key value store. And this store supports replication and consistency using Paxos, and it's based on a heavily modified version of Apache Cassandra. And having this distributed metadata allow us to scale from small clusters to large ones. I will now give you a brief overview of some of the data structures we use to store our data and a couple of the metadata maps that we have in this distributed key value store. So data in files are stored in units called extents, and these extents are grouped together and stored as extent groups on physical devices in order to improve the overall write throughput. So let's say, for example, we have a file and we have this 0, 1, 2, and so on, which represent offsets within that file. And that file has been written up to offset 3 with extents with ID 33, 44, and 56. And I have a two metadata maps in this distributed key value store. One is called the extent ID map, which basically maps the extent ID to the extent group ID, which it belongs to and an extent group ID map, which maps the extent group ID to the actual physical location of the replicas of that extent group and their state. So the idea here is if we want to find where extent ID 33 lies on disk, we first need to query this extent ID map in order to get the extent group ID. And with that extent group ID, we then need to query this extent group ID map in order to get the actual location. 
this multiple levels of redirection simplifies data sharing across files and helps with minimizing map updates. For example, if we need to move data from SSDs to hard drives, we only need to touch this extend group ID map. The second, main, the second main component to address this first challenge was building a map reduce framework. Uh, we process this globally distributed metadata using map reduce as it allows to perform efficient scans and joins of metadata tables. And these map reduce based scans provide us with a system wide knowledge of the metadata that we use to perform various self managing tasks. I will give you a I will show you an example of how we use this MapReduce framework to do tiering. Tiering is a task where we try to move code data from a faster storage tier to a slower storage tier. For example, from SSDs to hard drive or from hard drive to the cloud. Um, the idea here is to try to keep the hot data in a faster tier, for example, SSD, in order to try to reduce the overall user access latency. In order to do this, we need to identify the cold data, and we do so by using MapReduce. These MapReduce jobs will need to scan the extent group ID map, which contains the modified time of the extent group, and it also needs to scan a special map called the extent group ID access map, which contains the access time of those extent groups. So let's say, as an example, I have a four-node cluster, four cluster with no A, B, C, and D, and a curator process running in each of those nodes with curator master sitting in node B. Each of these curator processes will be in charge of scanning their corresponding portion of the Cassandra metadata ring. And let's say I have the modified time of the extent group ID 120 in node A and the access time of that extent group in node D. Uh, and we want to figure it out if that extent is uh, extent group is called or not. As we have these maps globally distributed, this is not this is not a local decision. So we use MapReduce to perform this kind of join. Uh, basically, in the map phase, we scan both of the metadata maps, and we meet uh, at the tuple with extent group ID as the key and the modified time or the access time as the value. And of course, they will go to a particular partition based on the extent group ID. In this case, curator A finds the modified time for extent group ID 120, and curator D finds the access time for the extent group ID 120. In the reduce phase, we, re we reduce based on the extent group ID, where we generate tuples in the form extent group ID, modified time, and access time. And we, are, we have all the data there, so we can sort locally in that particular node and identify the call extent groups. Uh, in this case, let's say that curator C receives uh, the data from the extent group ID 120. It forms that tuple. It will also receive all the modified times and access times of all the extent groups that belong to that partition, and it will be able to figure out which ones are called or not. Uh, we implemented many other tasks using curator, for example, this failure. Here, the idea is that when a disk fails, curator needs to find the extent groups that had a replica in that failed disk in order to replicate it somewhere else. Or for example, disk balancing, which is a task that moves data within the same storage tier, for example, within SSDs, to try to keep the usage of the disks of that tier as balanced as possible. A task like fault tolerance, garbage collection, and many others. There are much more details in the paper. So with this, we address challenge number one. Let's move on to challenge number two, the synchronization between background tasks and the foreground I.O. Newtonic dealt with this by co-designing background and foreground components. The idea here is that the I.O. service in charge of the foreground work provides a, an extended low-level API uh, to this storage management service in order to perform the background man maintenance tasks. Uh, this, this API is not just reads or writes of extent groups, but it includes operations like migrate one extent from an extent group to another, or compress an extent group, and things like that. Uh, the idea is that this storage management service only works on metadata and gives hints to this I.O. service to act on the actual data, and it's up to the I.O. service to follow the storage management advice. It may discard something because 
uh, some concurrent change made the operation unnecessary, for example. The background tasks are batch and throttle also in order to try to minimize the interference with uh, foreground work. And we perform soft updates on metadata. Uh, the way the metadata maps are read and written has been carefully engineered. So this storage management component always is a consistent version of the metadata. Um, but the metadata might, might be old. In that case, this IO service might discard the suggestion uh, to move data, for example. Uh, and we use compare and swap primitives to uh, do not hold locks in the metadata. I will show you some evaluation results. So the idea, in order to demonstrate curator contributions to the overall state of the cluster, we took data from around 50 real clusters over a period of two and a half months. Uh, and some of the results we found were, for example, that 95% of the cluster had at most 0.1% of under-replicated data, which seems to indicate that all these recovery tasks that we implemented are actually working. Uh, also, that 90% of the cluster had at most 2% of garbage, which also seems to indicate that the garbage collection tax seems to work. And there are more results in the paper. But let me go into more details on one of these evaluation results to give you a better sense on of some of the policies we use to trigger these tasks and to motivate the machine learning work that I will present next. So let us look at tiering again. The goal of tiering is to maximize the SSD effectiveness for both reads and writes. And curator uses a threshold to achieve some desired SSD occupancy. So in this plot, I'm showing a CDF where the x-axis is the SSD usage in percentage and the y-axis is the fraction of cluster. Uh, the idea here is that we see that 50% of the clusters have 75% SSD usage. That is the desired SSD occupancy set by default in Nutanix clusters. So if we go over 75% of SSD usage, we, we run that tiering task. The idea here is to try to keep as much hot data as possible in SSDs but also leave some free space in order to absorb new writes. Uh, we also see from this plot that many clusters have less SSD usage and also some that have more SSD usage. This leads me to the last part of the talk uh, on how we deal with heterogeneity. So this section is a more recent effort where we focus on replacing these threshold-based policies with some a smarter mechanism. Uh, note that the techniques that I will talk about now hasn't been deployed in production yet. Um, so we observe a lot of heterogeneity across our cluster deployments, both in terms of resources. Uh, some clusters were running more storage-heavy nodes, some were more compute-heavy nodes, and also in terms of workloads that they were running. Some were running more workloads of, for big data applications like Hadoop or Spark, some others were more server type of workloads like SQL Server, and some others were more BDI or a mix between them. And even within individual clusters, we noticed a lot of dynamic changes, like the workloads were changing over time, and there were different loads at different points in time. So this rendered the threshold-based heuristics suboptimal in some cases, as for example, in the tiering task, some clusters that are not issued too many new rights, might be better off by having a higher threshold. Some others might be better off by having a lower threshold, and so on. In order to address all this heterogeneity and these dynamic changes, we propose using ML, in particularly, uh, we use reinforcement learning. So I'll give you a brief overview of reinforcement learning, and then I'll show you some results. So reinforcement learning considers the problem of a learning agent that learns by interacting in the world. The agent senses information from the environment in the form of states and perform actions which lead to new states. The, by interacting in the world, the agent will receive rewards or punishments, and from this, it will see what to do next. The idea here is to try to learn a policy that maps situations to actions to maximize a numerical reward. And we are not just interested in the immediate reward, but in the, the reward over the long run. Another aspect to keep in mind is related to how the agent is deployed. We can deploy with no prior knowledge, and it will need to learn everything from scratch. If we do so, it may take a while until it starts making the right decisions. 
Or if we have some prior knowledge, we can, we can bootstrap the agent with that prior knowledge and then deploy it in the field and then keep on learning there. With this, it might be able to, to make better decisions sooner. So given that very brief overview on reinforcement learning, I will show you how we apply this into our setting. In particular, we use the tiering task. Uh, and we wanted to show uh, if the reinforcement learning solution could improve these threshold-based ones. Uh, so in order to apply reinforcement learning, you need to define what are your states, what are your actions, and what are your rewards. In this case, we consider our states as being the CPU usage, the memory usage, SSD usage, the number of input-output operations per second, which we also decompose in read IOPS and write IOPS. Our actions were just run tiering or not run tiering, and our reward was the latency. As we want high reward by, but low latency, uh, we use the negative of the latency. We could have used the reciprocal. It's an arbitrary decision. In terms of agent deployment, we leverage information from our threshold-based heuristics to boost up our agent with some prior knowledge. Um, although we know that these threshold-based policies were suboptimal in some cases, they represent some knowledge that can help us speed out the training process. So for that, we build a data set from real clusters that were using that 75% threshold that I mentioned before. In total, we collected data from 40 clusters after some cleaning up, we got 32,000 examples from which we had fine-grained representation of state, action, and reward tuples. And we pre-trained two models, one for each action. Uh, so I'll show you a summary of the evaluation. Here I'm showing the percentage of improvements of the ML-based solution with respect to the threshold-based one for five simulated workloads. Um, we're showing two metrics here, latency, which is the one that we optimize for, the one that we use uh, as a rework function, and also SSD reads. Uh, we run this in a four-node cluster. There are more details in the paper of what each of these workloads does, but just to give you a brief idea, for example, this OLTP workload is a typical database workload that does a lot of random reads and writes. This is skewed version. Uh, the 90% 90 90 of the reads goes to 10% of the data. This varying workload varies the load over time. Then we, we concurrently run uh, an OLTP workload within one of the nodes in the cluster, and the other three nodes were running more BDI kind of workloads. And this last one is a decision support system workload that does a lot of sequential reads. So we see that for every workload, uh, we see improvements both in terms of latency and SSD reads, some more than in others. But on average, the latency improvement of all of these workloads was around 12%, and the SSD reads improvement was around 16%. With that, let me conclude. So in this talk, I introduced Curator, a framework and system support for building background tasks. In doing so, we borrow ideas from big data analytics, but use them inside of a storage system. Namely, we use a distributed key value store for storing the metadata, and we use MapReduce to process that metadata. What I meant by inside, and I bold it there, it's because usually MapReduce, for instance, is built on top of a storage system. Here we are using it as part of the storage system itself. We also co-design background and foreground components. The IO service in charge of the foreground IO provides an extended low-level API to perform this background maintenance tasks. And the storage management uh, component only works on the metadata and gives hints to the IO service to act on the actual data. And we use reinforcement learning to deal with heterogeneity across clusters and within individual clusters over time. Some preliminary results on tiering show up to 20% latency improvements. That's it. Uh, happy to take questions. I'm Daniel uh, from, oh, where are you? Uh, you go first. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm Daniel from Dropbox, and I had a question if you um, have, have thought at all about uh, SSD wear or uh, like heat-assisted heat magnetic recording and basically the limited lifetime of disk writes, and if you think that that could be incorporated into this work. I haven't, we haven't thought about it, 
it might be. We can probably talk afterwards and you give me some hints and ideas, but we haven't thought about it yet. Right. Uh, Hong Zimao from MIT. Uh, I'm interested in your reinforcement learning work. And you were mentioning that uh, you were collecting data from your cluster and then train reinforcement learning on it. However, reinforcement learning requires you to interact with the environment. The data you collect from the cluster is like the fixed data. I'm wondering where is the interacting part to the environment. You need to build a simulator or you run your training on the cluster. So how do you? So I guess the question is, have we collected this pre-trained data to pre-train our model? So uh, the data you were using is to initialize your uh, parameter. Yes. So after in initialization, how do you proceed to do the reinforcement learning part? Yes. So I didn't. I skip a lot of details. We use Q learning and we use a function approximator in order to generalize more and have compression. Right. I, I understand that part. But okay. So we use linear models. So we pre-train two linear models with this prior data. And then we keep on learning while we deploy. Let's say we perform some task or not, in a, in a non-line uh, setting way, let's say. We perform uh, an action, um, we then collect the reward or so, and we update our model. That's how we keep on learning while the agent is deployed. So you do the training on your system. Uh, when, the, when the system is running, you do the training online. Yes, so we have an offline training where we pre-train our model to bootstrap the agent, and then we keep on learning in an online fashion while the agent is deployed. Yes. How fast is your system involved if you do the training all the time and interact with the system? So uh, what's the uh, time scale of the, of the environment? So this, like the experiments that we ran, they were kind of in the orders of hours. And we noticed that at the beginning, they, like they were making dumb decisions, let's say, but after a couple of hours, it figured out that it needs to make better decisions, and the decisions made more sense. Um, I think you're asking how much does it long to learn, let's say. How much does it take for the agent to kind of learn? That's, that was the question. So let's take the rest of this question yeah, I can, offline. Nacho will be offline. available right here. Two minutes. Yeah, nice talk. One so from NetApp. Um, I have a quick clever question before we go to the main question. So in this work, Hadoop cluster is a part of the whole HCI cluster, right? HCI is a storage industry jargon, but hyperconverged infrastructure where Nutanix is at. So you're using the same computing resources on the HCI cluster, right? Yes, this is a hyperconverged architecture where you have the computer and the storage in the same node. Yes, so the second question is, you know, the main question is, you know, the map reduce is a quite sort of batch oriented, right? So how do you deal with the update happens while you are running the job? You just ignore the update results? That's correct. Let's say, uh, uh, let's say you identify, for example, the cold data using a map reduce scan, and then you call this foreground component that will be in charge of actually moving the data down, for example. If that component figures out that the cold data is not cold anymore, it's hot because some new read or some new write came in, it will just discard the operation. It won't do it, let's say. It might cause some sort of threshing condition or like, you know? No. You know? No, we use these compare and swap uh, primitives in order not to hold lots of metadata, and we have these kind of carefully read and write orders of the metadata maps to always see, see a consistent snapshot, let's say. It might be old. In the case, if it's old, the, the foreground component will discard the results. Good, thank you. Okay, one last question. Marco from Kaust. So this is very interesting work. I also had a question related to the first reinforcement learning. So my curiosity here is uh, if you have looked into what it is that is being learned, that is, you know, ultimately uh, this is machine learning. So one could be, you know, some, uh, some magic machinery that does what it is. But would like to know if you gain some insights into what it is actually that the policy ultimately is learned and whether, you know, that makes sense from the point of view of the operations. Yes, it, as a, to mention an example of a plot that we have in the paper, the idea there is that we have, let's say for instance, where the cluster is highly utilized and you have, let's say, a, a low latency, there's no need for you to run these tiering tasks, for instance, even if you go over 75%. Uh, but let's say in that plot, we show that when the, the IOPS were low in the cluster and you kind of have high latency, okay, let's trigger the task and try to improve, let's say, the overall latency. 
in a sense, you can think of this as learning dynamic thresholds, uh, like uh, in, if that's kind of the question. And all of these policies that have been learned, do they make sense from an operational standpoint, or was there anything that you know, would be non-intuitive and uh, defying common wisdom? I think it do make sense because we show some results from an operational system and we show that we improve the overall latency and also we were hitting more stuff in the SSDs. Uh, we need to test this with more workloads and this hasn't been deployed. Uh, so I'm, my claim is that at least for these five simulated workloads, it seems to make sense and improve like results. Will you make, be making the traces available so that the research community Sorry? can look? Will you be making the uh, traces available so that the research community can also help out in that direction? Okay, that's a tricky question. I'm not sure probably if we can anonymize some stuff. Uh, we need to talk with the Newtonics folks to see if we can uh, release, let's say, this data set. Thank you. <laughs> All right.